Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Kirsten Wiley, and I am here today to introduce and welcome Dalton Conley, who is visiting us as part of the Microsoft Research Visiting Speaker Series. Dalton Conley is here today to discuss Elsewhere USA, how we got from the company man, family dinners, and the affluent society to the home office, Blackberry moms, and economic anxiety. Conley connects our daily experience with occasionally overlooked sociological changes, such as women's increasing participation in the labor force, rising economic inequality, generating anxiety among successful professionals, etc. In this book, Conley offers an essential understanding of how the technological, social, and economic changes that have reshaped our world are also reshaping our individual lives. Dalton Conley is University Professor of the Social Sciences and Chair of Sociology at New York University. He also holds appointments at NYU's Wagner School of Public Service as an adjunct professor of community medicine at Mount Sinai School of Medicine and as a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research. In 2005, Conley became the first sociologist to win the NSF's Alan T. Waterman Award. Please join me in welcoming Dalton Conley to Microsoft to discuss Elsewhere USA. Thank you. Thanks. Is this lavalier on? Can you hear me? Um, uh, thanks for coming. Sorry about the delay, air, air travel problems. Um, I have this up on the screen because I want to talk about the, the origins of this book, actually. And uh, the, the book really is in dialogue with a series of, of major sociological books that were written in the 1950s. Uh, this, that was a time when sociology was more read or, or was more of a, a public, part of the public discourse, the wider um, discussions of the politics and history of the time than it is now when it tried to, in the last 50 years, mimic the natural sciences and go more towards statistical analysis. Uh, and among the books that were written in the 50s to, that tried to capture that moment to sort of hold up a mirror, if you will, uh, uh, to so all of society, to a certain slice of society, uh, there was C. Wright Mills's uh, White Collar, there was Reisman's The Lonely Crowd, which gave us the terms inner-directed and outer-directed that are still used by marketing researchers today. Uh, there was uh, The Affluent Society by John Kenneth Galbraith, who's an economist. And there was the book that I, I'm most directly uh, in conversation with, and that is uh, The Organization Man by William H. White, who is a sociologist but also an editor at Fortune magazine. And he, in turn, was in dialogue with uh, one of the founding fathers of sociology, Max Weber, uh, a German sociologist or social philosopher from the late 19th and early 20th century. Uh, because White was trying to describe a change that had occurred in America it, through the New Deal and in the immediate post-war period that had come to fruition in the 1950s, and that was the, uh, the eclipsing of the Protestant ethic by what he called the social ethic of mid-20th century America. Um, to back up a bit and discuss uh, what the Protestant ethic is, uh, sort of you know, in, in cliff note version, is uh, the notion that, this is Max Weber's argument now, that uh, uh, during the, the, the reign, the exclusive monopoly of the Catholic Church in medieval Europe, uh, we, had, we were all embedded, uh, European society was embedded in a very hierarchical, structured uh, you know, church in which there was very explicit rites of passage, and if you did confession and took sacrament and followed all the rules, then you would go to heaven, and it was just a matter of checking off the boxes, right? And Luther had gotten so fed up with the sale of indulgences and the, 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 uh, the practice of, that had increased among uh, the church for monetary reasons that um, he nailed up his 99 complaints. The result, uh, the Protestant Reformation, uh, Weber argued, left individuals in sort of a state of ecclesiastical insecurity or anxiety. Uh, because before there was that set uh, paradigm to get to heaven, now you are left alone with the text, the Bible, and God 
to figure out your relationship and to figure out whether you were among the saved, the chosen, the blessed in the afterlife. Uh, and yes, there was a minister, but more like a referee than the boss, like the priest. Um, so uh, Weber argues that in this, this religious context, in this cultural context, you got uh, the Protestant ethic that, that generated uh, the birth of capitalism. And specifically, uh, in order to appear blessed uh, uh, in the afterlife, you had to prove that you were blessed on earth. That was the best indication. And to do that, you had to do two things. One was find meaningful work, what, a vocation, which literally means a calling, uh, and, and then work really hard at that. But on the consumption side, or the lifestyle side, if you will, uh, you had to live an ascetic lifestyle, a miserly lifestyle, and accumulate um, uh, wealth. That, plus the, the advent of double entry bookkeeping, Weber argues, were the two magic ingredients that give us capitalism. And his evidence is that capitalism emerged in Protestant regions quicker and more rapidly uh, developed in, in those regions than in Catholic areas of Europe. And in fact, Weber, when he came to the United States in 1905, thought that the, uh, his conclusion was that in the United States, the Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism was the most highly developed of anywhere in the world. So fast forward again another 50 years, and White is arguing that that was the dominant paradigm for most of 19th century and early 20th century America, uh, the, the sort of the, the, the interplay of culture and the economy. But Maybe it was the New Deal, uh, it was the rise of huge corporations that lumbered across our uh, social and economic landscape like so many ex almost extinct dinosaurs now, um, that changed the ethic into what he called the social ethic. Uh, it was also suburbanization that played a role. Uh, and in, in, unlike the 19th century, what he called swashbuckling entrepreneur, uh, that was guided by the Protestant ethic of getting ahead through pluck and hard work and um, social connections, like hustling, literally, uh, to, to drum up business. The, the company man, the organization man, in White's words of, of the 1950s, eschewed all that, because that was unseemly and thought of as nepotistic in a way to use social connections to get ahead in the company or on your own. And instead, um, the, the sort of... Uh, norm of, among large firms was to use uh, testing, um, meritocratic testing uh, that was supposedly going to reveal the color of the employee's parachutes and their given aptitudes and likes and dislikes and slot them into the right place in these huge bureaucracies. And uh, using your, your, your brother-in-law in Cleveland to get a job was seen as, uh, as totally inappropriate. On the consumption side, you know, the newly suburbanized America, thanks to government policy, uh, the, the, the organization man and his kathy clatching wife, as, as uh, White called her, uh, struggled to keep up with their neighbors, the Joneses. They, um, and that was through consumption. So you had to have the same car or a similar car to the people around you. You wanted the same appliances. If they got a new TV, you had to get a new TV and so on. And this, of course, would make the 19th century Protestant curmudgeon turn over in his grave. Um, the notion that the, the advent of the charge card and the, you know, sort of the precursors of credit that we now um, uh, suffer under the weight of today. So there was those inherent tensions between sort of the, uh, I don't want to say cultural DNA of the American uh, Protestant ethic and individualism and the Puritan settlers that, that brought it over with them, uh, with the 20th century consumer capitalism, uh, but they were, they were constantly in tension. So I argue that 50 years, fast forward another 50 years, that many of those tensions have been resolved, actually, um, in a kind of Hegelian dialectic process by redefinition. So, for example, today there is no choice necessarily between consumption and investment. If you redo your kitchen, uh, at least until last year, the notion was that uh, you put in a high-end sub-zero refrigerator and the, the Bobo's in Paradise uh, slate countertop uh, and other high-end appliances, that that was going to maintain 
it, uh, its resale value and in fact maybe improve the resale value of your house in a, in a rising housing market. So yes, it's consumption, but it's also an investment. Likewise, for the bacchanal uh, party thrown by Wired magazine, replete with the very expensive uh, guest goodie bags or doggy bags, or whatever they're called, the corporate um, donations back to the, to the guests, that's all an investment in, in client relationships, in partner relationships, in building social capital, which leads to the second uh, resolution of a, of a mid-20th century contradiction, and that's in a networked knowledge economy, now social capital is not fake, it's not getting ahead through nepotism, it is real capital. And so uh, the idea of soft skills emerges and, uh, and, and getting ahead through networking on LinkedIn or what, what have you becomes a legitimate form, uh, even a meritocratic form of getting ahead. So some of the mid 20th century tensions with the late 19th century have been resolved but at a huge, I don't want to say cost, because I don't want to be judgmental, but at the price of a, a sort of new social landscape, if you will. And that landscape, uh, as mentioned in the introduction, is um, the interpenetration of spheres that for most of the history of modern capitalism had been distinct. Work, uh, leisure, home, office, uh, public and private, even self and other, I'll argue. So this uh, in, is not just engendered by these things and the wire, the Wi-Fi and technology. That's the easy um, answer, I would say. And of course, that's part of the story that I'm going to tell of how we got here. Uh, but there are two other, at least two other uh, major socioeconomic forces that I think uh, intersect and, and uh, generate a forward feeding cycle with these kind of wireless uh, communication technologies and the nature of the knowledge economy, and that is rising economic inequality and the increasing labor force participation of women, and particularly moms. So in 19, in the, during the 1950s, and in, in that you know, nostalgic halcyon time, 17% of mothers with children under 18 at home uh, worked outside the home in the, in the for, formal labor market. By 1975, at the height of ERA now, ERA yes, um, the second wave of feminism, uh, only one third of moms worked outside the home um, a, 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 during the period when their kids were under 18. By the, now, in the 2000s, 70%, you know, might have dropped in the last year, but around 70% do, or more than two thirds. So we've gone from a, just since the 1970s, where the normative thing was for a mom to be home, um, not working, to a norm that's completely the opposite. So that has important consequences, which I'll get to in a second. Rising economic inequality, uh, it's a, uh, when I was a kid, um, my liberal mother would tell me that it's a story of the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer, and it was all Ronald Reagan's fault. That was the uh, story I heard. And it turns out she was wrong on both fronts. Um, so for example, the steepest rise in economic inequality in what's called the Gini coefficient uh, was between 1979 and 1981, single period of just almost a straight line up. And uh, that was, of course, uh, Carter, the beloved liberal uh, Jimmy Carter, um, before Reagan even got to pass a budget or uh, his budget director, James Stockman, got to touch, his, touch any sort of policy. And it turns out it's not a story of the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer. If you divide out uh, the rising economic inequality, which really has risen every year since 1969, into the top half and the bottom half, uh, i.e. the relationship between the median family and the bottom and the median family and the top, you find that the difference between the so-called middle class, Joe the plumber, whatever you want to call them at the median, and the bottom has been stable. Their, the proportionate shares of income among that group has been completely stable over the last three or four decades. It's at the top that the, economic, the, the inequality has risen. And in fact, the further up you go, the steeper the slope gets. And the, 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 even the second derivative, the, the, uh, the, the rate at which that um, slope has increased it ha it has, gets higher the further up you go. The result, I argue, is that 
anywhere you are on the top half of the, the dist income distribution, which is the population I'm writing about in this book, you feel what I call economic redshift. No matter, even if you're doing better in absolute terms yourself, you feel like uh, you're falling further behind in good times. And of course, in bad times, uh, you worry about holding on to the gains you had made in good times. So um, the combinations of these forces uh, are that for the first time in labor history, the further up the income ladder you go, the more hours you work, actually. It used to be that you, know, you worked hard, uh, you moved up the ladder in order to live the good life. That was the American dream. Now it turns out that the further up you go in the ladder, uh, the more hours you work. And that's because, I think, because of the rising inequality uh, and this sense of relative status that's never satisfied. The opportunity cost of not working trumps what was what uh, uh, economists call the income effect of the additional income you get when you get a raise. So in other words, um, it used to, uh, leisure is, just a, is, a, is a normal good just like a flat screen TV or a new computer or, or a fancy car. And so the more income you have, you buy more leisure, at least you have that, that effect. But it's also got what's called a substitution effect, your, your wage rate, even if you're a salaried employee, that the more you're paid per hour or per week or per year, um, the more it costs you not to work in terms of the opportunity cost. And for most of our labor history, at least as long as we kept records, the income effect trumped the, the uh, substitution effect, and now it doesn't anymore. And I would argue that that's because of the rising inequality that makes us feel more insecure economically, even as we're doing better. Rising labor force of participation of women itself plays a role in all of this uh, because it, it combines with changes in, the, in, the, in how and who we marry to in, in turn actually contribute to inequality. Namely, in the 1950s, uh, I mentioned that 17% of moms worked outside the home and the bulk of those 17% were low wa from low wage households. In other words, the quote, man of the house didn't earn enough money to pay the bills, and so a second earner would go out into the labor force. Today, uh, when the, the, the steepest rises in, in female labor force participation have been in the top half, and if anything, the, there's been a decline in female labor force participation in the bottom in terms of total work hours. The result, of course, is that uh, combined with the fact that uh, increasingly like marry like, what's called assortative mating, so in other words, uh, if you read Maureen Dowd's co columns, she likes to complain that all the successful men want to marry their secretaries. She couldn't be further from the truth. Um, sort of what's called class homogamous marriages have increased. In other words, the partner doesn't want to marry the secretary. The partner wants to marry the other partner. Um, and the, uh, the janitor is marrying the cashier or the waitress. And that's like doubling down in blackjack, if you ever gamble. Now you've got two higher earners and two low earners, and the inequality between them is, has increased. Throw in the fact that the, at the low end, uh, household formation and dissolution, fancy term for divorce and separation, is much more common. Uh, and the, the overall work hours have declined for low-wage workers as they've increased for high-wage workers, and you get this... Um, uh, situation where family dynamics uh, explain somewhere around 40% of the growth in inequality over the last 30 or 40 years. So these all feed into each other. Uh, we work more hours than any other nation now. Uh, it's, I, I almost have trouble believing this, but in the early 1960s, there was a presidential commission that was uh, called by Kennedy, but by the time they finished their work, they gave the report to LBJ, and they were worried about what were Americans going to do with all their leisure time, because work hours in the post-war period had steadily decreased. And I think they were given the notion that work is central to our identities. Th this commission was worried about, well, what are we going to become, a nation of golf and bridge players, and um, how are we going to generate any meaning? 
So, you know, lo and behold, they didn't have to worry about much because right at that point, someone says, if you know, the government has to get it wrong, because then uh, that was the inflection point and work hours started to steadily increase. Back then, we worked fewer hours than the Germans, than the Japanese, of course, but they were rebuilding their, their, their economies post-war. Fewer hours than the British, but even fewer hours than the notorious Italians and French, who, um, I, like I said, in, from today's perspective, it's hard to imagine that we worked uh, less hard than the French did in the 1960s. I mean, today we work a full six weeks a year more than the French do. And that's not even counting the fact that, um, you know, our, for many professionals, the workday never ends because uh, of the penetration of work and home. So, but lo and behold, we find ourselves as the most uh, hardworking, continuously working nation on the face of the planet. And given that just 40 years ago or 50 years ago that wasn't the case, it's not something about our inherent DNA, cultural DNA, if you will, I argue. It's actually the different policy trajectories that we took from our European cousins uh, um, 40 years ago in that the, the French have a slogan that they, they adopted called work less, work all. They highly regulated the labor market. Um, you can't work more hours if you want to. Uh, in many shops are closed on certain days and you can't open. Um, uh, everybody is like me there practically, a tenured professor. You can't fire anyone after one year. Um, the things might be changing now. Um, the European bureaucrats are trying to loosen things up a bit. But for the most part, it's a very different labor market. And uh, the spheres of life are maintained much more separately in a place like France, despite increased uh, penetration of cell phones, increased penetration of smartphones, um, the fact that Minitel existed there long before um, the internet. Um, so it's not just a technological story. If you go to a, a restaurant in France uh, and ask for a doggy bag, uh, they don't know, of course they don't have a word for that, but um, they, if you want to take food home, they look at you askance because uh, and which I think is a waste, but um, they want a clear division between eating out and eating at home. Not so for us, where more and more of what used to be provided in the social economy has been outsourced uh, to the formal monetized labor market. So I, that's kind of uh, a rapid summary of the book, but I want to show you uh, a few statistics and um, slides uh, to illustrate what the consequences of this are. I think I've skipped all the economic data for now. Talked about most of this. Um, here's an interesting chart uh, about the income and substitution effect because uh, a woman who has the same workout, imagine comparing two women, they work the same number of hours at work for their job and they do the same number of hours of housework and childcare and all non-paid labor. Earning more money, it turns out, stress, stresses them out more. So the higher paid woman is going to be more likely to report to survey takers that she's stressed out. Now she may not be, it may be just what the economists who did the study called guppy vetching, but, um, uh, but what they tell survey takers means something. It means at least the norm is to appear stressed out. Um, and I think they're onto something, and that is the important shadow cost of your wage. Of the more, actually, the more you get paid, um, if you're home with your kids and you're an attorney who bills $200 an hour, you feel m that, that lack of not doing those billable hours much more acutely than if you are a domestic who earns $8 an hour and who has to spend six of those eight on childcare anyway if you're going to go to work. And so it really doesn't pay much to go to work and you're not so stressed out by the idea that you're missing out um, uh, on career opportunities if you're, if you're doing unpaid labor. And women feel this, as you can see, more acutely than men. Um, how do we assuage our anxiety? Uh, this is um, garment consumption per capita. Um, and I as recently as 1991, we consumed an average of about 34 garments per year. We bought 34 new pieces of clothing per year. By 2004, the most recent year we have the data for, we buy w more than one garment per week. 
Um, so I, if you've ever studied anthropology, you'll know that in primitive societies, there's a thing called the potluck, where um, there's this grand circulation of goods um, that creates social solidarity, and then they're thrown into the sea, um, usually seashells or other like, precious stones, and they're thrown away as an act of sacrifice um, to create social solidarity. Well, um, they're not so different from us after all, it turns out, because we buy f over uh, one garment per week, and then we discard them. Um, and we uh, export here um, 500 million kilograms of, of used clothing to the rest of the world. Um, so if you want to get your old jeans back that you ga gave the Salvation Army by accident, they're probably in an open-air market in Rwanda right now. You can go get them. So at one time, clothes linked us intergenerationally. Um, you wore a suit and you darned uh, a suit because it was handed down to you by your father or your grandfather. If times were tough, you might even pawn a sweater or a suit and then take it out of hock when times were better. Um, and so it linked us intergenerationally. Now this, this kind of monetized potlatch is a way of just uh, uh, joining us through the marketplace in a circulation of disposable clothes that we get, give away. Um, talk about a little bit about the, dis the distinction between public and private. Another um, uh, important uh, modernist boundary that I think has been er eroded. Uh, I'll start with this slide, actually. Uh, does anyone know why I put American Express and the Statue of Liberty together? Because 25 or 26 years ago now, 1983, uh, the Amer American Express company launched what they called pennies for liberty. Going back to the Reagan administration, um, uh, who is this? I'm blanking on the Secretary of the Interior, James Watt, um, refused to give enough money to restore the uh, Statue of Liberty for its 100th anniversary. So uh, private donors started kicking in. Uh, in an echo of what happened 100 years earlier when uh, Joseph Pulitzer had to, to shame uh, people into donating money uh, by printing um, the names of everybody in his paper who sent in at least one penny um, for the fund to pay for the pedestal, which the government refused to pay for, to, to store this, to, to display this free gift from the French. Um, so American Express inaugurated the era of cause marketing. So we used to have a private sphere that was a for-profit sphere, and we had a public sphere that was both government and um, the nonprofit sector. And now uh, we have this blur. So you you get uh, mar a marketing strategy that relies on people's uh, guilt or goodwill or altruism um, and assuages their guilt in overconsumption by linking it to a, a charitable cause. Twenty-five years later, you get things like. Um, the Gap Red uh, campaign, and the, I think the most ironic one is Keeper Springs water, bottled water, um, by, run by Patrick Kennedy, uh, who, that donates all profits to the environment, even though bottled water is probably um, up there among the top ten scourges of the environment. Um, um, meanwhile, uh, I'm not old enough to remember this, but uh, in McDonald's, uh, you used to not bus your own tables. Uh, the, it was a private establishment, and you paid your 14 cents for your hamburger, and someone came and cleared it off. Uh, lo and behold, somehow the norm evolved that you were expected to bus your own tables. Now, how did that happen? It's, it's not like you're going to save money um, one more penny on your hamburger given you, especially since you already paid for it, and because there's a collective action problem that uh, it takes everybody to bust their tables to save money for the, for the uh, establishment, and, uh, uh, and how much of that savings will be passed on to you, probably very little. Yet, somehow we have evolved the norm that in a private establishment, we're doing, um, taking care of ourselves, taking care of the commons, even though in, in public parks, people litter. Um, the home office, uh, again, the distinction between uh, home, the, the sacred space of home, the cult of do domesticity, 
that arose in the late 19th century and then was reborn in the 1950s, where there was this domestic space that was sacred, and uh, you wiped your feet of the dirt of the marketplace before you walked in. Uh, that eroded too, and that, that, was, that, that movement was led by artists. Uh, in 1961, September 11th, 1961, 40 uh, years before the fateful September 11th, uh, the artists of New York threatened to strike. Um, I'm sure the city officials were quaking in their boots um, because they were caught between um, the business uh, uh, co building codes that were meant to protect the sweatshops that once uh, filled these, these post-industrial spaces and residential um, building codes. So they weren't allowed to work in their homes and they weren't allowed to live where they worked um, and, at, at, at odd hours. So uh, they threatened to strike, but it took about another 18 years till the first appearance of the word home office in the press, in the media, uh, uh, there was a, a, a kind of a, a pre-zine in 1969 uh, called the Home Office Guide that was self-published. But it wasn't until 1979 that uh, the media started talking about the home office. If you search uh, for home office on any of the, the databases prior to 1979, it's talking about that thing in England that's you know, part of the British government, the home office. Um, but uh, Starting in 1979, and then really with the spread of, of computer technology and the internet, you get um, the rise of home offices, and the IRS is befuddled. There's a, there's a series of court cases about how to treat these, and they're still arguing about it as they are arguing about these, what to do with these tax-wise. If you look at the, na the, the changing proportion of people who worked at home as their principal place of business, which is one of the litmus tests that the IRS uses, um, between the 60s and 1980, it was actually in decline. These are change figures. Um, that's actually the f final death of the family farm because farmers are considered home office workers. Um, but in the, in the 80s and the 90s, those proportions increased. Those are um, change rates, like I said, so even the lower bar is, a, is an increase. Um, and I'm sure that's even got higher in the 2000s, although we won't have that, those data until the 2010 census. So um, also the office, I, I'd love to hear about here, but uh, in a lot of new economy firms, the office has become more like home. It's not just that the home has become more like work. Uh, it's fun, food is free. Uh, it's food free here? No, see, uh, subsidized. subsidized, okay. Well, <laughs> so, okay. Uh, uh, well, at Google, food is free. Um, uh, you, there's every, uh, every service that a 1950 Stepford wife would provide you, whether you're a man or a woman, is here, including your laundry and your dry clean, um, uh, yards to play, um, including um, your one first free massage, um, and then after that you it's subsidized, um, and probably way better than your spouse could give you. So um, there she is, Babette, uh, the, the chief massage therapist. Um, Dogs are welcome. I don't know if dogs are welcome here. Um, but children are kind of frowned on. Um, and that's, I think, largely due to the demographic age structure of their employment force, um, although they do have emergency child care. And what we're really seeing in the, all of this is the reemergence, I think, of the 19th century company town. I predict within seven, within seven to ten years, they will have full on-site child care. They will have dormitories, essentially, or company housing, because Increasingly, folks can't the, the programmers can't afford to live in the area where uh, in Mountain View. Um, so here, so they right now the solution is to provide Wi-Fi enabled um, vans to go to and fro the lower rent districts in the East Bay. Uh, of course, you can work all that all the time. Um, in fact, if you've ever been to an English soccer pub and you've been in the men's bathroom, they have the sports pages over the urinals um, so that you can find out whether uh, your team won while you're relieving yourself. There they have, uh, and again, I would ask about here, they have coding instructions, um, debugging instructions, both in the stalls, the sit-down stalls, and in the stand-up urinals. So you can literally work all the time. And so it's an expensive HR strategy, but I think it's, it's sort of at the leading edge of spend a lot of money to make people want to stay at work and not go home and enable work all the time. Um, 
They also uh, steal a page from the newsroom, which has always had the bullpen-style offices of cubicles uh, and outer rim uh, conference rooms. Uh, but increasingly more firms are using this strategy, um, e and uh, even some public sector, uh, that's uh, public sector governments, um, that's Mike Bloomberg, my mayor, um, who, like any good New Yorker, renovated uh, when he moved in and uh, ripped out the corner offices. Uh, uh, you can see a, a bike hanging in the back in the, in the rack and installed the bullpen style that he used at Bloomberg LLP um, and got rid of the idea of status offices, the bigger office in the corner, and made those all conference rooms for when you needed to have a private meeting and the rest of the time facilitating the social networking of that's so apparently uh, important in the, the new economy. So the idea between the, the distinction between work and leisure is also collapsed, I argue. The number one uh, rapid growing personal consumer expense, uh, leisure expense, is actually gambling losses. So what we are doing during our free time is increasingly spending our money trying to make money, more money. And in an, a, a delicious irony um, of the industrial era, or f a flip of the industrial era, uh, what we, the number one form of gambling that's on the rise is slot machines. Not planes, poker, or blackjack, or betting on the horses, or, um, but slot machines. Uh, a completely mind-numbing activity of just putting a coin in and pulling a lever. The very act that once clocked us into the industrial economy now is our form of leisure. Um, whereas, if you worked on an assembly line doing some tailoristic activity all day long, um, you wanted to throw back a few beers with your friends and socialize. Now we're in a social economy where the low wage workers are often having to um, act with their permagrins on and um, uh, service the higher wage employees uh, in this constant sociability. The, the leisure is spent in a zone of privacy as these folks describe it to this uh, great uh, anthropologist who studies Las Vegas um, where they have their cup of, of coins and their cigarettes and their, their beer and no one bothers them and they can just play the machine for hours at a time and get into this zone. <clears throat> if you're familiar with uh, the ESP game that Google also invented, um, work and leisure have... Do they not invent that? Who invented that? Louis Vaughn on the CMU. The CMU? I thought they did reCAPTCHA. They also did this? Yes. Okay. You probably recognize him from a talk he gave at Google, which if many people is not in his work. Well, well I, I didn't see him at Google, but anyway, um, thank you. I, I, you're the crowd that would know. So um, <laughs> um, the, the, the notion, uh, well, I don't have to tell you what it is then. Um, uh, the, the notion that people are actually doing work, tagging photos at the same time that they think they're having fun. Um, uh, same thing with the recapture project, doing work um, while ostensibly you don't know you're doing work. And of course, um, there's a huge debate among economists uh, whether open source work is work or is it leisure or is it a signal to the marketplace that you're good at something um, and therefore will ha you're ultimately, if unconsciously, thinking you're uh, going to raise future wages. They, they are debating this endlessly in economics departments. Um, so even our kids are into the games, as you know. Um, uh, structured activity and non-school time uh, has increased by 40% since 1980. And uh, the differences by class are huge. So um, the amount of time that middle class kids spend in structured activities with non-kin adults um, is twice as great as uh, that for poor kids. And that gap is growing. So kids are learning how to deal in this so with authority figures in this social economy. Um, they're learning to be stressed out. Homework has crept down the, the, the grade bracket to kindergartners who are now stressed out about getting their homework in on time. And many of the games, I noticed, uh, have this market-based aspect to them. So uh, in Club Penguin, um, you, you do work. Um, food preparation, which is the fastest growing uh, low-wage service, sec uh, uh, low-wage uh, economic sector, which is an echo to the fact that high-wage folks have outsourced all of this uh, domestic labor. You do this to earn coins to buy food for your puffle pet, um, rather than just 
going to making a hole in the ice and fishing yourself as a penguin. So, um, and you get to redo your igloo, um, upgrade it. Um, and the, my favorite is the um, webkins, which completely reverses the avatar um, object or represent the signifier and the signified in that kids rush to get this stuffed animal. They rip off this tag um, and the animal just gets chucked over their shoulder because they want the code on the tag so they can go online and do the same thing. Knowledge games and also low-wage um, uh, tasks to earn money um, to pay for the, the pets. Uh, lastly, um, I want to go back to an, another 19th century social theorist, Georg Zimmel, uh, another German, who argued that it took... Um, modern urban capitalism to, de to develop individuality and the sense of individualism. And that's because in pre what, what's called now pre-modern society, once called primitive society, we lived in a, a social world that was like a series of Russian nesting dolls. So everybody in your family, in your household, um, was of the same ethnicity, let's say, and the same religion. And everybody in your tribe or, or kinship group lived in the same village and on outward to the same kingdom and the same um, race and so forth, right? Um, contrast that to uh, modern society where if you go to a city, if you migrate to a city, by definition, you're going to be living, let's say, in an apartment block with folks who are of different ethnicities or different religion. You go to work, the, everybody who you um, live with goes to different uh, employers, you do different jobs, unlike you know, the sort of subsistence farming of pre-modern society. So Zimmel argues it's actually ironically from the, these group affiliations that individualism comes. So if you sit and you list the five, your five or six uh, group affiliations that you have, uh, you probably are then, by, by number four or five, unique in the world, right? Nobody else is a Microsoft employee, belongs to this church, um, this PTA, and, you know, of this ethnic group, and this religion. So, you know, if you just go to five or six, but you're, you've used up all the degrees of freedom, and you're probably one, the only person in the world. And that's what Zimmel argues the individual comes from in confronting the difference as you move across these groups and spheres, and you're the only one uh, that has your unique intersection of all yours. But in the online world, um, uh, two things have happened. First, the distinction between public and private has eroded. So the, you have the um, uh, Irving Goffman, another 1950s sociologist, argued that there is this notion of front stage and, back st and backstage. Fr you know, the waiter comes out, is all deferent and, and performative and serving your soup goes back to the, the sh behind the doors, like upstairs, downstairs, complains, you know, what a, a jerk you are, and laughs that he spit in your soup, right? Um, there's front stage and backstage. That's the nature of intimacy, letting people into the backstage to see your, quote, authentic self, your cohesive, authentic self. Um, however, uh, in, an, in, a, in, a, in a society, in a landscape, where people are narrating every backstage um, activity uh, both in public spaces on their cell phones and um, uh, in their Twitter accounts and their Facebook accounts of updating everybody in the, and their grandmother about um, uh, how they just went to the bathroom or what they ate for lunch. Um, the notion that the, of backstage has been eroded. And so the whole notion of privacy is turned inside out. And the, I think the metaphor is not front stage and backstage, but rather um, the idea of the house of mirrors at the fun house. There's so much information out there that you kind of hide in plain sight. Furthermore, the fact that um, uh, so much more social life is taking place mediated, not face to face, you don't have to confront difference uh, the way Zimmel argued you did in, in the modern metropolis uh, as much um, uh, a, a, as we once did. And therefore, the difference in, in, in this, the generation of the self by perceiving yourself as somebody different, the exercise of seeing yourself as somebody who's not in your group sees you, um, is, is not as uh, prevalent. And I would argue that that erodes this notion of uh, the individual authentic private self 
that you need to find or discover that kind of modernist uh, impetus or ethic of find your authentic self and then use that as your lodestar in guiding your, the rest of your actions that you will be true. And that's not an ethic, I think, that uh, uh, continues to guide our, our behavior. Rather, managing the multiple data streams and um, uh, discombobulated affiliations that we have and, and, and learning to shift and code switch, to use the term that, uh, that Elijah Anderson uh, African-American sociologists used to describe how African-American professionals shift their language from work to home and so forth is something that's now pervasive, I would argue. So that's uh, uh, a lot. Um, I'll stop there and hopefully we have some time for discussion. Thank you. I was curious about is, I don't know if you can really compare to like 1950s household budget, today's household budget. Any ideas or remarks on that? Uh, yes, yeah, it's, it's changed considerably. Uh, in fact, it, it, the largest uh, household expenditure in the late 1950s was food. Um, and in fact, that's the basis of the poverty line that was computed during the Kennedy administration by a statistician named Molly Orshansky, who recently died. She found that uh, the, the median family spent about one third of their budget on food. So she calculated food budgets and then multiplied that by three and set that as the poverty line. It turns out that lower in, low income folks back then spent 50% of their take home pay, if you will, on food. Um, today, food is a minor expense. It's gotten so cheap, which of course has its own problems um, in terms of the obesity epidemic in the United States. And the number one expense is housing and also uh, health care and education and transportation. Service, so basically utilities and, and, uh, and real estate. Uh, and that I think makes a very different um, set of challenges than we face in the New Deal if the Obama administration or anybody else wants to sort of uh, make a new social contract or a new New Deal uh, in that the, all those goods have um, or services have two aspects about, one, one or both aspects about them that they're, they require a lot of human capital. So for example, health care um, requires, is very human capital intensive and so is education. Um, or they're relative goods. So uh, housing is generally a relative good. Yes, we want shelter from the elements, but we also want to be in the best school district because that's good for our kids or we want a, a bigger house and so forth. Uh, education is certainly relative good. Um, housing is, I mean, um, uh, health care is generally not, we don't think of that, I want to be more cured than my neighbor or my, my coworker. You just want to get cured, so it's more of an absolute good, but it's still, still high human capital. So those are real challenges um, to provide economic security as compared to, say, food insecurity that was a major problem in the 1930s during the Dust Bowl. So I, I think there's got to be a lot of new thinking about how do you, um, for example, maybe through open courseware models, make education um, uh, flattened, or maybe through actually taking on the monopoly of doctors on prescribing authority in order to really provide universal health care, or you know, give more authority to physician assistants and, and nurses and so forth. So something's got to change with the structure. You can't just say, well, we're going to deliver more health care to a growing population. And, and, and not increase the supply of doctors or change the roles that different folks play. So, so I think those are, um, you know, go from household budgets and what people are spending on to social policy is, it, it reveals a lot of uh, um, difficult choices ahead. Yeah. So this is kind of, kind of an odd thing, but I, I've, noticed that, I've noticed that there's a lot of social trends toward things like simplicity, you know, simple food, um, simple cultures, communal living, a lot of things that are kind of trying to revolt, revert back to some of those 1950s ethics in a lot of ways in society. Do you see any trends of kind of this decentered affiliations kind of regrouping themselves in a kind of going back to the old way sort of way? And going back to your um, going back to your nesting dolls analogy, how do you see those things sorting themselves out into that nesting doll? Um, well, to answer the first part of the question, 
Uh, I think that all ages in all ethics or, or modes of living you know, will generate their antithesis uh, by definition and some sy synthesis will occur and that's you know, 50 years from now they'll look on our period with the same kind of um, quaintness or nostalgia that we look on the 50s and think it's so, they were so earnest and naive. Um, some, some new social arrangement will think that of us. Um, I also think it's really interesting that, you know, I hear from many folks who say, well, yes, I, I know what you're talking about, and I sold my business, I sold all my belongings on eBay, and then I moved my family um, to rural Maine and built a cabin with my own bare hands and a hatchet, and that was all we had, um, and I cut off all connectivity. I mean, people take, some people are taking very drastic actions which, as, a, as a kind of reaction formation to what's going on. I think for most of us, the challenge is, you know, can we really turn off our blackberries during family dinner? Just let's start with that as a first step. Um, I'm not saying we should even, but I'm saying that most of us are struggling with those kind of management issues um, on a, at, a, at a much more fine-tuned level. And maybe, it, maybe those folks who pack it all up and um, drop out and tune in or whatever the expression is, have it right, that the only way is to really just go cold turkey for everything. Um, uh, so that's, I, I, I would think that the slow foods and the sort of uh, simple living movement is part of um, this landscape as well, um, just as the beatniks were part of the anti-conformity movement in the 1950s. Um, now, the, I'm not sure I understand the second part of your question about the, the, the Russian nesting doll analogy. Talking about how people's cultures kind of, you know, centered around me, then my family, then my mm -hmm. community, and went out to the kingdom and religion. Uh, like, you know, there's that set that within some of these simplicity movements, they kind of go back to the core of me. And where does it, you know, as as those cultures type of kind of develop, where, you know, around green economies and mm -hmm. ecological conservatism, and you know, um, even when it comes down to technology, I mean, I see a lot of that even on things like Facebook. Mm -hmm. Where you know there's these little communities of people forming, and then you know they found me, their new avatar me, and then they're building their own little culture out, you know whether it's um, around a religious cause or environmentalism <laughs> or something like that. And, and they're you, kind of creating this new nesting doll. Do you think they're really concentric though? That like every like if you're in this, let's say you know, some sort of anti-vaccination movement uh, uh, online or um, geographically, um, that everybody in your movement, sh you know, has the same affiliations moving outward? I would doubt it. I would say that, like, maybe you're a member of the anti-vaccination movement, but you're not a member of the, you know, um, uh, the, the social movement to raise the bottle deposit to 50 cents per bottle or whatever, some other environmental... I, I wouldn't... I, my guess is that they would not be concentric circles, although is, isn't it uh, the island off of Washington here with the anti-vaccination movement? That's why it came to my mind. Um, off of one of the islands in the Sound that folks got together and decided nobody is going to, and this geographically co-located island is going to vaccinate, va vaccinate their kids. Um, which is more dangerous, actually, because there's not even the herd immunity. Yeah, that's the polio island, right? Is that, is that <laughs> what it is? <laughs> yeah, so anyway, I, I don't see geographic co-location, which is necessary for the Russian nesting doll, um, to be as a common element right now. The geographic co-location question is a really interesting one in a political perspective. Because if you look at how our voting constituencies are built, they're built over geographic co-location. And as our society becomes, you know, there are still cultural communities, but they're no longer geologically uh, co-located. It seems we're reacting with things like polit political action committees, lobbying groups, to see our, our political structure, our constitution perhaps, eventually adjusting to deal with this changing right. markets of interest. So, so rather than having, having two, two senators per state, maybe you have two senators per social grouping that, you know, reaches um, 20 million or whatever, um, you know, one, right. yeah. No, I, I think that it's a really interesting political or organization. I've been thinking about that more in line with social policy. So ge geography still plays such an important role in the way that folks move out of certain policy jurisdictions um, and then abrogate their responsibilities to less fortunate folks uh, in the social contract. And yeah, I, I <laughs> <laughs> um, the, um, 
Well, I can't blame you on that, no. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, so, the, you know, I'm talking about school districts, namely, is the, the premier example of where, you know, uh, because they are still geographically located, it drives the housing market so much um, that you want to be in the, 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 quote, right school district. So imagine um, what, I, what I'm trying to imagine, or you just escape that, that, that institutional setting completely by sending your kids to private school. And then you have no stake in the, social, the public social contract of education whatsoever. So imagine a, um, a, a social insurance model, you know, a typical New Deal model, but it's not organized spatially at all by state or um, by school district, but it's organized by random assignment. You can't opt out. Um, you're randomly assigned to a, some Facebook group that's based on a random digit generator or, you know, the minute and hour you were born. Um, and, you know, maybe that would be better so because everybody was born at um, uh, this pe period um, is lumped into the same social group and then you have some totem to rally around, um, astrological. Um, and anyway, you're as randomly assigned to a group of, say, you know, 5,000 folks in America. And you are the risk pool for health insurance. You are the, you are, you are the, uh, the pool for um, paying for education vouchers, and you can all collectively decide how much you're going to um, fund an education voucher, and you, and you, but you have to pay it. Um, you become like a, ta a taxation group and so forth, and you allow that kind of organization where people can't escape, but it's not geographically organized. I, I'm all for that. I, I don't know when we'll you know, ever get there. I think that we really need a huge collapse in anarchy before we're going to get to this um, model or we can just start a new country somewhere. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, the geography is, is kind of this messy thing that's getting in the way of a lot of other things, the way we're organizing ourselves these days. Do you have a question before? I had a couple of thoughts. One is I have three children that are, you know, digital natives, and um, they... Is that a new term? Yeah. <laughs> Born digital, but they, um, I'm trying to sit there and explain things, like, they don't, they literally don't think, they don't have this conversation with themselves or each other. They don't think there's a good or bad about having a Blackberry on at dinner. There's no good or bad about not getting together with people. And they want, sometimes want to get together face-to-face -face with people and sometimes want to be online, and there's no, you know what I mean? They don't have any kind of values mm -hmm. with that at all. So they're going to move forward, you know, living this way um, without wrestling with that, you know. And so I think it's kind of, um, it's the given world that we, the, the landscape's already changed mm -hmm. as they move, you know, to be 21. And um, just kind of what things you think, as a, as a, you know, we should put in place policy-wise to kind of just recognize that and go, you know. Well... I mean, I do think that a lot of what I'm describing or the kind of conflict I'm describing is very specific to my generation in that, you know, it's wonderful that grandma's on email or Skype and that's cute, or whatever. She can see um, Junior, you know, and wave to him. But um, that's kind of a, a curiosity. And then there's these kids who never knew anything different. Um, it's the poor suckers like me who grew up in a pre-internet world but now face this reality um, and are trying to negotiate through two very different norms and sets of cultural values. Um, yet, before I kind of buy into that, I want to say that I think there is there's a tendency to conflate age effects and cohort effects, um, to use the demography terms. So, um, for example, I also hear that from people who research the quote millennials, um, I never heard the term digital natives before, but um, that they're, they're rejecting, increasingly going to the simple um, life movement and rejecting um, the court of rat race and the whatever you want to call it, the, the mainstream economy. But, you know, yeah, it's easy to reject it when you're 22 and 23, um, but, you know, that's been, that's part of the American story. Well, let's see how much of that, um, uh, you know, that they're not bothered by the tensions between the kind of constant connectivity, for example, versus where they are physically. You know, the, the attention, um, the virtual need for attention and the, in contrast with the, the geographic need of attention of people in our surroundings. Maybe they learn to manage that, but maybe it's that you know, when they don't have their own kids, um, uh, infants or children that need their attention um, and they're not, you know, um, dealing with stresses of bills and so forth, that it's easy to... to um, not feel these tensions and it's actually a stage of life phenomenon that when you're managing the, the trying to balance the, the household responsibilities, the unpaid labor if you will, and 
um, the, your career and, and your social relationships that are now increasingly mediated, that that's when you start feeling the tensions. It could be an age effect. It could also be a cohort effect, a historical um, effect. So I think both are at work, and it remains to be seen how it's going to play out for this group as they move into childbearing and, uh, and uh, you know, serious demands on them by employers. But it's, I think there, sh there should be lots of anthropologists and sociologists studying this group as they, they age up um, uh, to see what's going on with them. Well, like for example, one of my daughters said to me, why don't we have, you know what Urban Spoon is? Urban Spoon? Where you can just shake your smartphone and get the closest restaurant of the kind of restaurant you want, blah, blah. Well, she said, she said to me, no, Irony, why don't they do something like Urban Spoon for, so you can find the nearest farmer's market? Do you know what I mean? Like in her mind, that's not a contradiction at all. You know, it's like that's your technology to go, you know, to go to the slow food thing. So I mean, they don't think of it as confusing. I think that goes back to the simple thing. They're they're, they're compromising the drastic simplicity people and the technology people who you know absorb their whole lives with it. They're bringing it together and they're making technology simple. And they're looking for ways to make technology to use technology to simplify their life. Things like Twitter. I don't have to write an email anymore, I just have to write a quick line of what I'm thinking. Even Facebook, for me, Facebook's become a way for me to reconnect with circles of people that I used to connect with when I was in a different geographical area. Mm -hmm. So it's not about, my nesting doll is not about geography anymore. My nesting doll is about uh, maybe a cost. Or, you know, my center nesting doll is, is about a different thing than geography. Um. I want to pick up the, one of the, the first thing you said, though, the idea that they're using technology to simplify, um, because that's just been the false promise of America for a long, long time. I mean, in the mid-20th century, autom that they thought that, and it seemed initially that automation was the, w was the ticket to this widespread leisure class. Um, uh, but if you look at the data, uh, we actually do more... Um, you know, housework now than we did in the beginning of the 20th century when we didn't have washing machines. I mean, so of course, yes, um, the washing machine makes it easy, but um, doesn't completely eliminate it. And also, it breaks down, and you're on hold to um, Mumbai for um, two hours trying to um, get it, troubleshoot it, and so forth. So, th you know, this is our sort of um, our national techno optimism that these kids are. Um, suffering from because, of course, every email generates um, the need to respond um, to another email. So uh, I don't think that this notion that it's going to simplify things, I, th I think they're in for um, a surprise if that's, the, if that's the goal. I mean, it doesn't have to be the goal. I'm not saying simple is better. Or I'm, I'm, for, first of all, I'm trying not to be judgmental or nostalgic or anything as I describe what I've described. Um, uh, but, but but I do like to sort of poke holes in um, uh, people's uh, sort of optimism, <laughs> if you will, um, that I think may be unfounded. Um, I kind of had a question related to the, the Born Digital is a book that, I don't know where the guy was from. Was Harvard. Harvard. Harvard, yeah, yeah. Um, and um, I have older daughters, like both in their 20s, and a younger daughter, 15. And one of the comments you made about the individual, authentic, private self isn't an ethic that's in our behavior anymore, really. Um, and my 15-year-old had lots of problems, and she's gotten into the technology, and she created selves, different mm -hmm. selves, in these different worlds. Um, is there... When we grew up, it was different. So we're kind of coming at this from different ethics, but our kids don't have any of that perspective of these different ethics, right? And so they're only seeing this not in, you know, I'm, I'm part of this group, and actually I don't even have to be really part of that group. All I have to do is pretend that I'm part of this mm -hmm. group, and eventually I come in. If she got into drug use and all kinds of things like that. Um, how do you... How do you merge those two worlds? Because they're very different worlds of, uh, you know, our kind of people who grew up without the technology learning to use it versus, I don't even know what this old, you know, my, my daughter wouldn't even know what the old ethic was or, or a way to get to it. Uh, is there a way to, to, in other words, to impart the old ethic upon the younger generation? So 
of the problems is, you know, if you're a mom, like my husband, we both work here, you know, we've got the smartphones, we've got this, we've got that, we've got these structured, unstructured time. But what we think is good, or, or you know, how to make most use of our time, it's, it's this change in ethic of, if you're working all the time, therefore you're making more money, therefore you're, <laughs> you know, you're advancing yourself kinds of things. Does that somehow negatively influence our kids and, and so they aren't learning the same ethics. I you know, they aren't learning the I, private self even. Yeah, I would agree with all of that except for the negative part that I don't think, I, again, I'm trying not to be morally judgmental because um, people in the 1950s thought that entrepreneurial, the, the kind of uh, person who conflated social life relations, for example, with um, business, that, that was violating one of the, the, the hard, fast, hard, hard felt norms of modern capitalism. It was only with, when modern capitalism, industrial capitalism emerged that you had this ethic of you don't um, lend money to friends, you don't do business with relatives, you don't um, mix business and pleasure, you don't shit where you eat, all this kind of... Um, and, uh, that was a very strong norm. Today, that's gone. I mean, you just said that both you and your husband work here. So um, that would have been unheard of. And it's, uh, yeah, um, uh, 50 years ago. So is that better or worse? I, you know, each social arrangement creates its own um, benefits and its own problems and tensions. I don't think there's anything better or worse. I think that the, and there's always been a sort of generational clash as, um, so I'm not sure that you, you might be fighting a, a, a losing battle trying to impart an ethic of um, individual authenticity and uh, et cetera um, in t into a teenager today rather than trying to reach them on uh, their own terms, if you will, in their, in their, within their own ethic, which has its own norms and its own values that may be functional and useful just as ours were. I'm not a child psychologist, so <laughs> I, I, I don't, you know, have any formal advice, but I don't, um, but generally, um, I think we can't hope, um, again, at least it's these ages, again, I, I don't know what's an age effect and what's a cohort effect, um, to, uh, to instill old school values, necessarily. Yeah, there's these things like, back in November, end of November, this one kid killed himself online, and he actually told people, he was going to kill himself. And people thought it was a joke. Or, or the other people that were, you know, listening to the, to the blog and stuff like that. Or it's like, oh, it's a fake, somebody wants attention. Um, I think it's the House of Mirrors, we don't know what's real and what's not. So there's, um, so in a sense that it remained a private act because nobody believed it, I right? I recorded it as webcam going, took his pills and laid down and people watched him die. Online. And nobody did anything because well, of... Well, there was a mixture of reactions. I mean, some people thought that it was fake. Uh, yeah. No, I mean, some people knew it was real, but also had been, you know, dialoguing with him for a while and thought that this was a choice he was making and it was a perfectly legit thing for him to do and they weren't judgmental. Then there's other people. You know, there's a whole range of reactions. Mm -hmm. Isn't it interesting because suicide would have been the one thing you would have always done in private in the past? I mean, uh, I mean, the, the, um, the whole field of sociology was founded by a book called Suicide by Emile Durkheim, which set, set to explain what w he said, set up as the ultimate private individual act um, and showing how it is socially um, determined to a certain extent or socially influenced by things like religion and uh, the economy and a uh, sense of normlessness or, or integration or lack of integration to groups' life. So uh, I think it's an interesting uh, case study. I think if that's all the questions, we should probably just close. So, thank you.